Hey everyone, last week I shared that we have joined with seven other podcasts who form The Democracy Group. We each present different viewpoints on strengthening our democracy and the social contract that binds us. Sign up for the newsletter at democracygroup.org. Today, we're featuring our first interview with a guest from a fellow group member. Just by chance, a few months before we even knew that we would join Democracy Group, we spoke to Jerry Taylor of the Niskanen Center. Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Jerry Taylor. He's the president of the Niskanen Center, which he founded in 2014. He's working on winning the war of ideas amongst conservative policymakers in order to pass climate legislation. This episode is a break from the idea that individual action is at the center of mitigating climate change. Instead, this is about the power of public policy for decarbonization on a global scale. This is a global collective problem that requires a collective global solution and all of the mindfulness that one person may apply in their lives to reduce their carbon footprint is collectively not going to do very much. As long as the energy infrastructure looks like it does, you can economize all you like on how much energy you use, but if that energy is coming from fossil fuels, it is not going to address this problem in the meaningful sort of way that we need to address it through public policy. We'll be talking about the psychology of climate denial, the political realities behind policymaking and a carbon tax. And we also discuss how climate change is a collective global problem and that taking fossil fuels out of our economy requires legislative solutions. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'd like to start with your two decades at the Cato Institute. You spent much of your time there as a professional climate skeptic. What is the foundation of climate change denial? Well, it's mostly psychological. I mean, people on the right look at climate activists and environmentalists in general as people who have long held a grudge against uh, industrial civilization, against fossil fuels, against material progress and consumerism. And they see climate change as just the latest in a long series of attacks on free market industrial society. Environmentalists have become wrapped up in the democratic coalition and are part and parcel of the progressive left. So that makes them their tribal enemies from the get go. And a lot of people on the right remember cries of wolf with regards to environmental apocalypse scenarios that never really came about, like the population bomb, which panicked America in the 1960s and early 1970s. The idea we were running out of all our resources, our ability to feed ourselves, that was a lot of concern that uh, came to naught. And so for people on the right, they look at environmentalists and climate actors as people who have a relatively poor track record and who have a grudge against free market societies. And uh, that naturally puts people on the right into a position where they work very hard to dismiss the problem because they don't like the solutions they think that would be coming through the door if they acknowledge the problem. It's a pretty tight argument, basically, to say that there are people who cry wolf and nothing happened, even though there are storms and hurricanes and fires and everything. As long as they don't touch you personally, it feels like it's not actually a problem. What do you think is the most compelling argument for people on the right to shift their thinking about climate change? We know that public opinion is largely a reflection of elite opinion in Republican circles. So if you want to change their minds, uh, you're going to have to change the minds of thought leaders. And so at the Niskanen Center, we focus on waging and winning the war of ideas amongst the people who are actually involved in policy change. And those elite leaders on the right who uh, lead opinions in conservative circles. And in that circle, the strongest argument is that there's a lot of uncertainty about what climate change will deliver unto us. We know the planet will warm. We know there is going to be increasing acidification in the oceans and a lack of oxygen. We know there are a lot of extreme weather events that are going to follow. But exactly how bad it will be and how quickly it will run its course is unclear. 
And we should be hedging against those risks. I mean, risk management is what we're talking about here. And in any other context, Republicans understand this, but they seem to have a blind spot when it comes to climate change. You don't need to get them to say, look, Al Gore was right all along, and I now need to make a public confession. But they can certainly say that climate change is playing out in front of our very eyes. It's absolutely undeniable. There are risks involved and that we need to take those risks seriously. So that's a very compelling argument, right? How much success are you having with that, with uh, GOP leaders? Well, a lot of our work is behind closed doors right now. There's no real political window of opportunity for climate action. And so nobody in the Republican Party is going to gain political capital by being too upfront on the issue. So our job is to help educate them, to make them comfortable with this issue, to help them think through what a Republican or a conservative or a libertarian response might be relative to, say, the Green New Deal. We've had some really encouraging conversations uh, with Republican leaders behind closed doors. So we'll only really know how well we're doing in this front when a political window of opportunity comes, and then we're going to have a, a real roll call to see who is where. What does a political window look like? At what point will you be like, okay, this is it. We have to act now. Well, a political window of opportunity will be when a Democrat's in the White House, or at least somebody whose name isn't Donald Trump. As long as Trump is in the White House, there's no opportunity for moving meaningful climate action on Capitol Hill, period, full stop, and end the story. And at least one of the chambers of the uh, Congress needs to be in Democratic hands, preferably both, but at least one. Under a scenario like that, if you're early in a new Democratic presidential term, the window will be open. Whether we can successfully get through it is unclear. I mean, if you look back in time, political windows for meaningful, ambitious legislation open up only very infrequently, sometimes only once every 10 to 15 years, and they close quickly. So the job of policy actors like the people at the Niskanen Center is to do your work while in the wilderness so that when that window of opportunity opens, we can move through it as quickly as possible. Because if you try to draw up a policy on the fly or build coalitions as you go, you're usually going to mess it up. That's why the work we're doing right now, while there's no chance of climate policy at, at the present time, is so critical in making sure that we can succeed when that opportunity comes. I like that you are keeping your nose to the grindstone to make sure all of your ducks are in a row when it's time to go. I have a question about your conversion from skeptic to embracing the fact that climate change is real and it's happening. How did that happen? It was a gradual process where every pillar of belief I had was slowly knocked out from underneath me. About a decade of working on this front, I discovered that the scientific narratives offered by climate skeptics that I had relatively unquestioningly accepted were just incredibly dodgy and couldn't hold up the scrutiny. And once you discover that, then you have a choice. You can continue to offer dodgy arguments for tactical political purposes, or you can rethink the argument you're forwarding. I backed away from the scientific arguments and tried to make economic arguments. So, well, even if you believe the mainstream narratives about climate change, removing fossil fuels from the global economy within a matter of just a few decades is staggeringly expensive, extremely difficult to do, and would probably cost more than the uh, impact of the lower end scenarios that would, might come about through climate change. And that story you could actually tell reasonably well in the 1990s and early to mid 2000s. But with the collapse in the uh, cost of low carbon energy, which made addressing climate change extremely more plausible, with the strengthening of the scientific consensus, which really knocked out the argument that the lower end scenarios for climate change were particularly likely, and the fact that by about 2006, 2007 or so, you literally could not find a single credentialed economist who published in the peer-reviewed literature on climate economics who'd make that argument. And believe me, I know that because my job was to go find them. And I could find people like that early in my career at the Cato Institute, but they all eventually bled away. And that really says something, that you can't find a single credentialed economist who publishes in the peer-reviewed literature on the topic to bake your point. Well, that probably means the point you're trying to make isn't very strong. So how does this inform your advocacy on the Hill? Well, it makes it a bit easier because I can certainly understand why a member of Congress is skeptical about climate change. Because I used to be that person myself. I was there for 20 odd years. 
it provides for a lot of credibility when you're sitting down with these folks where you can say, look, I know this literature a lot better than you do because it was my job to make sure that it was in your hands. But I changed my mind, and let me tell you how. Now, that's the sort of story that connects with people because it immediately builds trust. And of course, I came out of the Cato Institute, a trusted place as far as Republicans and conservatives are concerned. So often in politics, it's less important what you're saying than who's saying it. So if somebody from the Sierra Club or Greenpeace are trying to have this conversation, say with Senator Tom Tillis, they're probably not going to get very far. But the fact that I uh, uh, come from the place I do gives me a lot better chance to uh, make the case and to make sure that the minds are open to actually listen and consider what I'm saying. It's very persuasive that, of course, you have this background to talk to conservatives in power on your conversion. But how has this changed your outlook politically? Because you are officially still libertarian. In theory, there's nothing wrong with being a libertarian and also somebody who believes in climate change. But in America right now, that's perceived as not being possible. How do you square those two things away? Well, a couple of things here. First of all, the idea that how you believe free markets work and your interest in individual autonomy should have nothing whatsoever to do with how you read scientific evidence and arguments. These are not ideological matters. I mean, things either are or they are not. The fact that we look at scientific evidence through ideological lenses is, is a real problem. Uh, but it's a very human problem because people have motivated cognition. They want to believe what they want to believe. My change of heart about climate science and climate change has had a huge impact on my ideological outlook. Uh, to, just to correct the record, I don't consider myself a libertarian any longer. And in fact, I wrote an essay last year called Against Ideology, in which I made the argument that my old libertarian uh, sentiments really don't hold up to scrutiny anymore. What ideologists tend to do, of, of all stripes, is to hold one consideration more important than any other in American politics. So if you're on the left, it might be social justice. If you're on the right, it might be uh, individual liberty, free markets, individual virtue. But the reality is, is that all these things are important in American politics. So though I came from the libertarian world, which used to hold that individual liberty and autonomy was the most important consideration in American politics, I no longer do. Wow. Okay. My next question is about the Niskanen Center. Why did you start it? What do you hope to achieve? The first reason was that I had lost my faith in climate skepticism, and while that was an important part of my job at Cato, if I wanted to make alternative arguments, I probably had to have a new place of employment. The second reason is I thought that the libertarian world was wrong about how to go about achieving policy change. It was our belief that policy change occurs when people who have the most influence on public policy are persuaded to uh, invest political capital in that change. And a lot of the libertarians think that if you change public opinion, then naturally politicians will follow. That's a nice thought, but for the most part, there is zero correlation between public opinion and policy change in American politics. If there were, the NRA wouldn't be anywhere near as strong as it is, for instance. Minority views tend to win in American politics, not majority views. But I thought that our old world, the libertarian world, need to pay a lot more attention to Congress and Capitol Hill than it had been. And then the final reason is that we wanted to give voice to a heterodox version of libertarianism, which really didn't get a lot of voice in Washington, D.C. There is a tradition within the libertarian world to take social justice seriously. If you don't believe that, read John Stuart Mill, who was required reading at the Cato Institute. There are libertarian professors who are in favor of reparations to uh, black Americans as a response to slavery. There are libertarians who are relatively pro-labor and who hate right-to-work laws. And I think those arguments from a libertarian perspective are actually fairly powerful. There are obviously libertarians also who believe in carbon taxes and things like that to address climate change and other pollution matters. But as I said, as time went on, it became increasingly clear to me that holding up a banner for an ideology or an ism was becoming increasingly more difficult to justify. And I kind of lost heart in that, in the idea of flying an ideological banner in the first place. What you describe about the Niskanen Center is really exciting, actually, that really it's about independent thinking and that you are going to make up your own mind about what's important 
for society. So you mentioned briefly in your answer just now about carbon tax. In fact, that's your proposed solution. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, uh, there, there are a lot of virtues with regards to a carbon tax, but the most important is it gets right to the heart of the problem. The prices for fossil fuels today are being subsidized, and they are incorrect price signals because they're not accounting for the full cost of production, which have to include the cost of damages. And if you were to press any conservative libertarian and ask them, does the economy work well when the price signals are messed up? where they're not accurate, where they're not reflecting true economic information. They'll tell you, no, that's why the Soviet Union collapsed. No, that's why uh, F.A. Hayek won a Nobel Prize. Of course, we have to get price signals correct because they transmit vital information to consumers and producers. And with a carbon tax, you're internalizing the environmental damages into the price signal and then crowdsourcing the response to climate change to millions of producers and consumers. These are really controversial matters. Are we going to really ask Congress to sort out all of these matters in the economy and to ration energy or at least ration fossil fuel consumption in the course of decarbonization? That is a stunningly complicated and ambitious proposal that I think is beyond the ken of mortal man. If we simply get the prices right for uh, climate damages and then have each fuel pay its true burdens, then you're crowdsourcing those uh, questions to lots of profit-hungry producers, to consumers. While that can't be the sole and sum total of our response to climate change, it certainly should be the main response. It also has the virtue of applying immediately. You pass a carbon tax in a piece of legislation, yeah, the next year it's in play. If you pass aggressive or ambitious regulatory initiatives, it might take a decade or more for the time where you pass this stuff before it goes through the Administrative Procedures Act and all the hoops and jumps that it has to go through before it actually is enforced in law. And we don't have 10 years for that. We don't have the time to go through normal practice. And so this argument that we should look to carbon pricing as the main response, that's not just a right-wing argument for a bunch of neoliberal economic professors. It's the consensus of opinion And finally, it's also something that can resonate with conservatives and Republicans. So if you're going to draft up a plan for addressing climate change, you're going to have to put together a plan that speaks to some extent to people outside of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. And carbon pricing of the sort that I mentioned has been embraced by leading libertarian economists uh, throughout academia and in the public sphere. It's embraced by ExxonMobil and BP and Royal Dutch Shell. It's embraced by the majority of the Fortune 500 corporations in America. It is basically the harnessing of capitalism to solve a problem. And it just so happens the Republicans have that ideal tool in their toolbox, and they should be unlimbering it. That's both the intellectual and the uh, political case for why we embrace carbon taxation. Well, carbon taxation used to be a thing that we used to talk about all the time in the 80s and 90s, and then people just stopped talking about it, and it fell out of favor as an idea to tackle climate change. What is the mechanism for the carbon tax? Assume I'm, let's say, Exxon. How does it work? Well, you could write a carbon tax in any number of ways. The most efficient way of dealing with this is to tax the uh, carbon content of fuel as close as you can to its source of production. So, for instance, if we want to address methane emissions, which are leaking from natural gas pipelines, you can theoretically work out a tax for that, but it's far better just to address it with direct regulation. So the taxing hammer can't be everywhere. But you want that tax to be applied upstream, as it were, as close as you can get to the source of production, and you need it to be economy-wide. And once you've done that, you've got an extremely efficient and clean mechanism for addressing climate change. So when you say upstream, we tax Exxon directly, or you're saying, right. yes. Or okay. whoever's producing whoever's it. I mean, some oil companies it. don't produce. They're somewhere in the refining business where they're not producing fuel. They're simply buying it from the producers. But if it's taxed upstream, it's going to be passed on to consumers downstream. Right, right. Of course, it'll be priced in. Mm-hmm. So how do you come up with the pricing for that? I'm just curious. Well, that's a tricky matter because we're not entirely sure what the environmental damages are from emitting a ton of CO2. Because of the uncertainties with regards to the science, that introduces a question mark. Then there are low probability, high impact scenarios that are extremely difficult to price. So for instance, what happens if we get hyper accelerated Arctic ice melt 
beyond where we've expected it to be. We know that can happen. Given that uncertainty, the ideal price for uh, greenhouse gas emissions and carbon is uh, probably higher than is the political will in the United States to embrace that price. And so our job is to get the highest price we possibly can given political reality. If the upper end of what can be imagined politically is a $45 a ton carbon tax, well, then that's what we're going to try to lift. If the upper level is $30, well, that's what we're going to have to try to lift. Even though I certainly hear from progressives and climate hawks frequently that the atmosphere doesn't care about your politics. Well, that's certainly true, but we have to deal with the political world we have, not the one we wish to have. And in a world in which we have to deal with uh, climate skeptics and the Republican Party and the resistance to higher fuel prices, politics becomes the art of the possible, not exhortation for the impossible. Yeah, that's definitely true. And it's very hard, of course, to pass on higher gas prices at the pump. Well, you know, the transportation issue is relatively tricky when it comes to uh, carbon taxation. What we want are high enough prices to dissuade people from consuming fossil fuels. And the reality is, is that if you drive a car and you're using gasoline, uh, you don't change your consumption patterns very much. This may be a place where carbon pricing needs to be complemented with other policies, like a simple mandate for an increasing percentage of the auto fleet to be made out of zero carbon fuel technology, which is a path that uh, Europe has gone down, China is even going down, and a number of states in the U.S. are starting to consider going down. So that may be a means of response. I have a question about how all of us can get engaged here, because your premise is that really it's the policymakers, the people that are already serving in Congress that are really going to make these decisions, and you are talking to them to change their minds and rally around a carbon tax solution, let's say. So as an everyday person, what can I do? You know, there's a number of parties and actors and efforts to suggest to people how they can reduce their carbon footprint by eating less meat or how best to go about showering or washing your clothes or taking your vacations uh, and that sort of thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But the reality is, is that this is a global collective problem that requires a collective global solution. And all of the mindfulness that one person may apply in their lives to reduce their carbon footprint is collectively not going to do very much. As long as the energy infrastructure looks like it does, you can economize all you like on how much energy you use. But if that energy is coming from fossil fuels, it is not going to address this problem in the meaningful sort of way that we need to address it through public policy. And it's also a fact that there is an increasingly disturbing amount of social science research that finds that people who are mindful of their carbon footprint and are acting in their personal lives to reduce it become less supportive of legislative action to address climate change because they feel that they are doing their part already through lifestyle changes. And, well, they may very well be on their part, but collectively it's not enough. The reason we're working on Washington and not writing self-help books about carbon footprints is that if we're going to rip fossil fuels out of the global economy by 2050, which is what we're going to have to do to eliminate the higher-end scenarios for climate change, it's going to require one heck of a lift that is simply beyond the ability of individual actors doing their thing, particularly since there are a lot of people who just don't agree with you, who live in Texas, who vote Republican, and they're going to drive their Ford F-150s regardless of what you do as far as your own consumption patterns. Okay, that's depressing. <laughs> no, 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 but you're totally right. You're totally right. I'm I'm a big believer in public policy, and I'm a big believer that sound public policy changes behavior and works. So why are you passionate about this issue? You are so well informed, and I can really tell that, you know, your heart is really in this. Why is that? Well, it's the most important issue of our generation. If you care about the future of the country, You care about the future of your kids. You care about the legacy that you live when you're on this earth. To sit here and watch the planet slowly burn and to deliver a hellscape potential future to our children and grandchildren 
is unconscionable if the main objection is, yeah, but it'll cost me a quarter more at the pump. Yeah, well, then maybe it will. But isn't the planet worth saving? So the cause is powerful and it's just, which has a lot to do with my passion here. The second, of course, is I did not always believe that this cause was particularly just or persuasive. And now that I have, I've got a lot of bad karma I have to address. So uh, I have some catching up to do. But the Niskanen Center deals with issues beyond climate change. We deal with poverty and welfare issues. We deal with immigration. Uh, we deal with regulation. We deal with health care. These are big issues that have important impacts on people's lives. And all the people at the Niskanen Center are working here because we're trying to make this country a better, more generous, more prosperous, more fair, and less divisive place. And climate change is an important part of that picture. Here, here. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? What makes me hopeful is that climate denialism as an important part of the American political culture, I think, is on a very much borrowed time. Increasingly, it's impossible to deny that the climate is changing around us. Even amongst Republicans, they can see that the planet is burning all around them. There was a survey last month that found that the issue that Republicans disagreed with their party more about than any other issue was environmental policy and climate change. And the same went for independents who leaned Republican. We're hearing Republican leaders now increasingly, like even Kevin McCarthy, acknowledging that the GOP has to get out of its prison cell of denialism and come up with answers to public policy on this front, because otherwise they're going to be politically incapable of competing in suburbs where if they can't compete, they can't win national elections. There's a lot of political momentum now, which is serving to break the denialist wall in the GOP. Unfortunately, it's not coming as quickly as we need it to come. But you can see the stress points building up, building up, building up. And usually once the break occurs, policy change happens relatively quickly. I can't predict when it's going to happen, but you can see all the signs. And so that's what gives me optimism. That is indeed very hopeful. Thank you for your time to be on Future Hindsight. Thank you, Mila. This interview is really the first one where it really hit me that what we need first and foremost is collective action at the highest levels to address climate change. And further, I finally understand what decarbonization really means. It means replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy in the global economy. Indeed, this will take much more than eating vegan or recycling or not buying new clothes. Changing our lifestyle and demanding less of our planet's resources is still valuable. But I do agree that reducing our individual carbon footprint alone will not solve the problem. One thing that Jerry Taylor has in common with Bill McKibben and Katherine Richardson is that he also sees a momentum building for demands to take action to protect the environment. Judging from the fact that a Republican friend of mine sent me a book about how to achieve decarbonization, I hope that we're really getting close to public opinion being squarely for climate policy. Next week, our guest is Julian Brave Noisecat. He's the Vice President of Policy and Strategy at the think tank Data for Progress. He's also a prolific writer on climate justice and indigenous issues. We'll be talking about the intersection of social justice and equity within climate policy, what durable climate policy should look like, and what we can learn from the experience of indigenous communities in surviving the loss of their world. There's a lot of issues of public health and air pollution, particularly because of all the freeways that run through lower income communities in Oakland and black communities in particular. There's uh, some serious affordability issues. Their big challenge is to try to do this green transformation at the same time as they try to allow people who have been in Oakland for generations to stay and benefit from the investments in this new green economy that's being built in California. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. The executive producer and host of this program is Mila Atmos. The audio producer and music composer is Peter Fedak. The associate producer is Miriam Zumbu. Additional production by Brooke Sayan. Listen to us online at futurehindsight.com or your favorite streaming service. Thank you.
That's all for this week on Future Hindsight. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to Future Hindsight. And consider sharing us on your social media or with your friends. Word of mouth is the best kind of endorsement we can get, and it helps us produce more great content in the future. Also, if you have the time to rate or review our show on whatever podcast app you use, we greatly appreciate it. It might not seem like much, but those ratings really do help. Also, feel free to drop us a line at hello at futurehindsight.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'll be back next Friday with a new show, and we hope you'll be there too.